Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Chris is busy admiring the artwork on my walls, the ducks and the red-breasted goose beside me. Um, now, I understand it's going to take a while for everybody to get online to join us, but we are thrilled to have so many of you with us this evening. A huge welcome to Norfolk Wildlife Trust's first online event of this year. Now, this is a very special event for a couple of reasons. The first is that this year we are 95 years old, not personally, I must say, um, even though the Norfolk life is very invigorating and youth inspiring. Nonetheless, I personally am not 95 years old, but Norfolk Wildlife Trust in two months time, on the 6th of March, we will celebrate the 95th year of our purchase of Cly Marshes in the north of Norfolk, which is what began the whole of the County Wildlife Trust's movement. So we're very thrilled by that. We're doubly thrilled because we are joined this evening by two very familiar faces, Megan McCubbin and Chris Packham. A very good evening to you and welcome to Norfolk Wildlife Trust Cly Calling Events. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. And, 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 and a vote of congratulations for the long legacy of great work the Norfolk Wildlife Trust have been doing. I was drawn to its attention in my um, in my early teens by John Were Buckley. You? Oh, John yeah, Buckley, John Buckley. Yeah, yeah. who um, he had a friend who was a curator of natural history at the Norwich Castle Museum, and he would constantly loan him publications from the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And I remember reading one with great interest when I was into great grey shrikes. And Norfolk was always a, a good place. Norfolk, Norfolk Coast always a good place for great grey shrikes. So, yes, Norfolk, fabulous county. <laughs> I would say probably the second best county second in best, England. Well, best. second to Hampshire, of course. Uh, yeah, second, you know, second, second best. Easy, Tiger. <laughs> very careful. How many breeding spoonbills have you got in Hampshire? My goodness me. Well, hold on, hold on. How many breeding Dartfords have you got in? And we could go <laughs> oh, on. Oh dear, night. it could go Actually, on. We do have breeding Dartford warblers. We genuinely do have breeding Dartford warblers. Come and I'll show you. Anyway, we hope now that everybody has joined us. In which case, I'm going to have to mute poor old Megan and Chris for a moment and go through a tiny bit of housekeeping. So if anybody didn't catch the very beginning, welcome. We are delighted to have you with us. And a special thank you to anyone who's joining us for the first time. We are Norfolk Wildlife Trust. My name is Nick. And this is a series of events called Cly Calling. Now you can find out all about them on our website for these events called clycalling.com. Now we used to run these events. Do you remember the days when we used to run events in person and we used to talk to actual people. We can't do that anymore and so we do everything online but you can find out about upcoming events on our website which is plycalling.com. The next one next month will be um, talking to the wonderful wildlife authoress Melissa Harrison who lives in Suffolk just one county to the south and the following one we're delighted to welcome back Roy Dennis whom I spoke to in the summer when his most recent book came out but he's got another one about rewilding coming out and we'll be speaking to him in March, just around the 95th birthday of Norfolk Wildlife Trust. Now, the meat of this evening, which is an ironic expression considering I'm assuming we're all vegans, I certainly am. Um, the meat of this evening is the discussion of Chris and Megan's new book, Back to Nature, How to Love and Love Life and Save It, which has just come out and is a ripping read. And it's been a great privilege and a great joy to read it. And we'll get to questions about that in just a moment, but we would very much love you to purchase it. Now, if you should wish to purchase it after hearing our discussion this evening, there is a link in the chat. And if you go through that link, you'll be taken to our friends, Wild Sounds and Books. Now they're great friends of Norfolk Wildlife Trust and they supply the books for all of our visitor centers, but they're also friends of Chris and Megan's. And a 10% donation on any purchase, it's slightly different according to whether it's a signed copy or a non-signed copy, but if you follow that link, you will have an explanation of the donations that are made, but a 10% donation is made to charity, some of it to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, some to charities of uh, Chris and Megan's choice. This event is free. However, this has been a very tough time for conservation organizations. This has been a time when our visitor centers are closed. It's been a time when funding streams have been turned down or streamed down, streamlined. I'm, I don't know what streamed down even means. Um, and so should you wish to make a donation as a result of taking part this evening, we would be 
delighted for you to do so. And there's a link so to do. And the final really boring bit that's just me, and I apologize here to Megan and Chris, is that we are currently fundraising and we would love your help. If you're new to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we're raising money at the moment to purchase a new reserve in the Brex. Now, Megan, last year, when, was it last year or the year before when you had your bio blitz? It was, was yeah, we, was it in 2018, wasn't 2018, it? 2018, yes. Our bio blitz, and Chris and I went around the UK to essentially survey what biodiversity was doing and figure out exactly, you know, what populations were doing high and what wasn't doing so well, and we went to were you, 50 oh, sites. disingenuous, because you say that we did it, but what we didn't, what we did was organise teams oh, of yeah. people. Oh, yeah, yes. We did a little bit of We did work. a little bit. We drove but, around, but, but it was the teams of people on the ground that were doing all the surveying and the bio Yeah, experts. so we got as many experts together as mm. we could in a number of uh, locations, 50 locations actually around the UK, and we asked them to blitz their patch, and, and mm. if they'd already pre-blitzed the patch, to re-blitz it to see if there were any trends, and discrepancies yeah. and um so we we the team <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the uk team. team of all of these people clocked up about five thousand species in yeah. um, in 10 days didn't we yeah it was pretty it was pretty amazing it was um yeah it was incredible feat from scientists recorders communities children schools that came in to do it as well so it was a really big kind of effort and it wasn't just about counting species and finding rarities and having all of those people with extremely focused interest out counting dipterans it was actually about getting people to engage mm -hmm. and one of the great joys of it was that we did get an enormous numbers of young people and you know natural history newbies into into uh, into the event and they came out and we reached out we we, we know that in all 15,000 people attended our events so, I mean, some of them, there were two or 3,000 because they were on large reserves. Some of them were on community reserves. Mm -hmm. and that fantastic one that we went to in South Wales. And we got there and, and there was barely enough space in this community green area for all the people to stand on. Yeah. So many people had turned out, in, you know, and beyond the swings and the seesaws <laughs> in that little bit of woodland there where they were mammal trapping and they'd done a moth trap and bits and pieces like that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and everyone was having a picnic and it was, it was great so to see all of these people from that community who had walked there, um, you know, literally smothering the ground with their blankets and sandwiches and, and you know, bananas and, and bits and bobs. And, 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 okay, and we were wandering around showing them things on the end of our finger. And, they, and it was joyous, you know, yeah. that this very um, urban community had, had come together for that. How magnificent and what an achievement. And we look forward to days when we can all do such things again in person and meet one another and share this passion. But the reason I particularly wanted to raise the BioBlitz and hear about your experience was because you came to our Wheating Heath Reserve in the Brex, which is in the southwest of Norfolk. Now, we're currently fundraising for a new patch of land, not on that reserve, but next door to our Thompson Common Reserve. Now, Thompson Common is a priceless, priceless gem. It's home to what are called the Pingos. Now, Chris, are you familiar with Pingos, Chris and Megan? You are. Chris, give us a quick yeah. background on Pingos. Okay, so Pingos are a, 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 glacial, um, a glacial relic, if you like, and, and they're caused whereby you get a, a, a block of ice which is sufficiently large that it remains in the landscape, and then when it eventually gets round to mounting, so in the wake of it, you know, as the glaciers retreated up the UK as things were getting warmer, they were leaving these large blocks of ice in the landscape, and if the substrate was of the right type and the conditions were right, you got this block of block of ice, but they, it would become covered in soil, but eventually the, the ice would melt and then you'd get a depression and you would get a, like a, a dew pond almost. And it was a glacial dew pond. And there's some beautiful, beautiful dew ponds and, and you know. So, and on our Thompson Common Reserve, we have 400 of these. It's the, yeah. it's the national epicenter of pingos. And they have a very characteristic rampart because as Chris says, the ice, melts and as it does so the soil tips off the top the lens of ice is rounded at the top and the soil gathers around the edge now these we have 58 red data species living in these pingos and we have the opportunity to purchase a patch of land around the edge where we have what are called ghost 
pingos. And we have the opportunity to dig them out and restore them to their former glory and also return farmland to being this fabulous low nutrient sandy grassland lying on top of Norfolk's Cretaceous chalk. And so we would love it if anybody is minded by Chris and Megan's conversation this evening to support us in our appeal. There's also a link in the comments and you can see a film. I regret to say the film is presented by yours truly, but you can see a film about the work that we're doing at Thompson Common to restore wildlife there with traditional breeds of livestock with all sorts of ways of managing the land in order to enhance its biodiversity and we're planning to do the same. So please, if anybody's watching who happens to be a multimillionaire with some spare cash, we would love to hear from you. However, I have wittered quite enough. It's time to get to the important bit. But before I get to the book, Megan, specifically a question for you. My word, you've had a year. My word, you've had a year. What's it been like? Um, I would describe it as a bit of a whirlwind, if I'm honest. It has been totally unexpected and um, surprising in many different aspects. Of course, it's been an incredibly difficult year, you know, for the reasons we all know, COVID, lockdown, and it's brought about some, you know, incredible circumstances that we've all had to face. And I've been, you know, I'm, I'm aware, I'm so incredibly lucky to have had the opportunities I've had this year um, to, to be as busy as, as Chris and I have been. We started the South Isolating Bird Club in March and started broadcasting, you know, at an hour a day. Um, we're doing kind of live homemade Facebook TV essentially. Um, and we got Fabian Harrison and Kate Crocker on board to help produce it. And we had guests from all around the world and we were talking about wildlife that we were seeing in our back gardens because we wanted to share it with the people that might not have gardens or might have balcony or a roof space um, and not kind of as kind of rural as we are. So we wanted to kind of share a bit of positivity. Um, and then from that point, kind of Springwatch got in contact and said, oh, well, you've been doing stuff by sitting bird club. Do you want to kind of pop on and have a go at <laughs> Springwatch? So, um, yeah, I was really excited to get the opportunity to do that. And that's kind of led on to Autumn Watch. We're about to go into Winter Watch. Um, and of course, we've written a book. So it has been a whirlwind of a year, to say the least. And it's been, uh, you know, my favourite part has been building up this amazing community of people with the South Isolating Bird Club who have been so disconnected from families, friends, loved ones, but have found kind of a connection with one another because of a united interest for wildlife, whether that's a new thing or something that they've been doing prior to COVID and lockdown. It's um, been fantastic to see them supporting one another and engaging like that. What a joyous thing to have achieved but also been part of during such a brutal and difficult year where people have been so so miserable in many cases where there's been so much suffering so much deprivation so much loss what a what an incredibly empowering and beautiful thing but I have to ask you another question Chris block your ears what's it been like working with the stepdad oh god awful it's exhausting if I'm honest I don't get a break I don't get a moment silence it's just you know you have to you to dip through that dip through that anyway no it's been great <laughs> It's been really good. You know, we get along incredibly well. We have a lot of fun. We, you know, know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And I think we complement each other um, quite well. Yeah, he doesn't have any weaknesses, apparently. Oh, is that so? Is that so? Um, well, I think I mentioned one because I heard you on Loose Ends and Clive Anderson asked you um, on the 5th of December, he asked you about um, what it was like working with Chris. And you said, I do often say, do you think about the things before, think about things before they come out of your mouth? So yeah. I do I'm say sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Occasion, occasionally. <laughs> sometimes the wellspring of passion is hard to control. Yeah. And I say what I think yeah. um, all, all of the time, probably more in this kitchen than, than outside of the kitchen, uh, <laughs> which is good for the rest of the world. But um, yeah, Megs and I don't have any secrets, that's for sure. And, um, yeah. and, and we share a passion and, and, and a forthright one. But I, yeah, I, I know I can be quite um, enthusiastic sometimes. But look, you know, it's, we, we both get up in the morning and, in, you know, albeit at different times. And, and, <laughs> and, and no, hold on, albeit at different times. And, and, and with the same <laughs> desire. And that is that, you know, we, we kind of care, but we recognise that's no longer enough. We actually want to do something to make, you know, our natural world a, a better place. And, 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 and to do that, we, we, we can't do it on our own. We, we need that community. We need the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. We need all the Wildlife Trust. We need everyone with that passion. And, and that was what South Isolating Bird Club was about. It was about bringing those people together. And, and now I think we face a different challenge in many ways because 
as much as we have lived through a period of time where people have engaged with nature and they found that, you know, got a euphoric, you know, response from that, and they've learned that birdsong, you know, can really help them and looking at wildflowers, all those sorts of things. We seem to be living in a very angry world where there's an enormous amount of division and, and, and hatred and intolerance. And I think we as a community, people who share a passion for life, all life, everything that creeps, crawls, slithers, slimes, stings, all that stuff, then we should recognize more than any others that this is a time to actually come together and reduce polarization and reduce all of those sorts of things. But it's, it's, it's really tough at the, at the moment. You know, when, if, you, if you try to say something positive about the environment, someone out there will accuse you of lying or you know, exaggerating it or something like that. And it's a sort of a tough environment to make progress. And that's why I think community is really important and why we need to stick together and have a, that sense of commonality. And, and, you know, for us, as Megs has explained, you know, we were able to initiate, um, not, not anymore, because it is a community, it's not, it's not ours, we don't own it, um, that community of the Self-Isolating Bird Club. And it's joyous to see all of these people who do care and do want to make a difference and they do talk to one another and they are positive about it and you know there's a little bit of, if there's any negativity in there we do what we can to um, nullify it and modify it you know and really the result obviously the, the self-isolating bird club if I say there's a result of it I'm not implying it's finished and I'm not implying it can be boiled down to one thing but its essence and its importance and all of that the network that you've created, this web of enthusiasm is distilled into this book. And as you say, we it's very easy for us to make positive noises. Um, and we ourselves, and a tiny, tiny microcosm, the reason we started at Norfolk Wildlife Trust doing these online events, and first we approached our wonderful friend, Patrick Barkham, who you interviewed him in Self-Isolated Bird Club in the spring about his new book, Wild Child, and he's working on another one just now. I spoke to him today. We, we launched our first event very tentatively with him because we wanted to keep our wonderful followers, all of our members, all of the people working for Wildlife in Norfolk in the loop. We wanted to be giving them something and you've been doing the same, but just talking isn't enough. And that's really what the book is about. Now I want to, before I go on to specific questions about the book, I need to say something really important for anyone who hasn't read the book. The way it works, forgive me talking about your book, but Chris talks about a lot of issues and Megan talks about a lot of new information, science, um, that responds to the issues in a sense. So the two things go hand in hand through the book. And I want to preface my questions, particularly to you, Megan, that it happens that a lot of the really juicy stuff that I want to ask questions about, the words are written by Chris, but that in no means implies, I think you're not an equal partner in the, in the mission, as it were. So if I quote Chris, it's not because I'm meaning that Chris has written the book. It's simply because the words that are about the biggest issues, the scariest stuff are often the ones that are written by Chris. But all of my questions are directed really very strongly to both of you. Now, Chris, I want to begin really, and this, these are your words, it happens, but summing up the book with something that you said last week, it was a broadcast that you did online. And you said the words, we need to evolve our thinking. We need to evolve, if you like, as a species, if we want to continue to thrive with a quality of life that's worth thinking about on this planet. And that means making changes. It means stopping and thinking about whether we are making the right decisions. It's about updating those decisions, changing practice. It's about changing minds. It's only through creative conversation that we can move forward. Now those were said in a different context, but to me that sort of summarizes, encapsulates the, the book that you two have written together. Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. Megs has put the sparkle in the book, all, all of the new science, all of those things that you're going to want to read and then you're going to have to ring up one of your mates. You would have formally told them down the pub, but that's not allowed. So you will want to ring them up and say, did you know? I can't believe it's true, but... And, and that's what Megs has, has found out and added to the book. And, and, and Megs brings all of that sort of joy and sparkle to it. Um, and as much as she tried to rein me in from my ranting. Well, you'd like to go off on ranting. But, you were sat there just ferociously. <laughs> but I, there are certain things that need to be said. 
And, and if someone doesn't say them, then no one gets to think about them. And, and the key thing about the book and about our attitude is that we never tell people what to do. We, we offer them the chance to change their mind. We offer them an alternative. We try to lead them in a direction where we illustrate that moving in that direction makes sense. Now, they, they don't have to do that. It's not an order. It's not a prescription. You know, we're, we're not preaching. We're, we're mainly just, what we're trying to do is generate, as, I, as you read in that quote, a conversation about things that we now understand. And the need to change our mind, which you referenced, is because the world has changed. And things that you and I, Nick, would have done when we were youngsters are, are no longer socially, ethically, morally, or, 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 or sometimes even legally um, allowed. That's, that's it. We, we have to update our, our mindset. But the one thing that I've learned, and I haven't learned a lot about the human species, because I'm not particularly great at engaging with them, but is that we struggle to change our minds. I know I'm guilty of it. I struggle. I still listen to punk rock music. Why is that? Why haven't I moved on to Northern Soul? I do try giving him some other options, but he doesn't seem very pleased about you know, it. You know, set up a playlist, Megan. We'll work on it. Yeah, I'll do that. But yeah. you know, it, it, we are slow to change our minds. It's really hard, and I think that. The other thing is that sometimes when people realize that they're batting on a losing wicket and really they don't have any choice but change their mind, then they can become very defensive and, 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 and they back themselves into a corner and, and then they become very recalcitrant and they tend to lash out and that generates the division that I, I mentioned earlier and it's, it's really disappointing. I mean, and you started the piece by referencing uh, veganism and you're vegan, I'm vegan, Megan isn't. Um, and I am that, very strict. I'm strict. You're vegetarian, yeah, and has always been all your all, all life. But it's, that's not a criticism. It's not an issue between Megs and I because, you know, when it's right for her, if it's ever right for, for Megs, you might go in that direction. And, yeah. and that's the way that I feel about those sorts of things. You know, we try to lead people in the direction that we think is right at that point in time obviously retaining the capacity to say, oh, I got it wrong, I changed my mind too, um, and, give them those, and give them those options. And I, when we came to write the book and we divided up how we were going to do it, so Megs does all the linking up, does all the sparkle, and I thought, well, there are some home truths that we have to put on the table so that people can think about them and decide whether they are acceptable at this point in time, in a contemporary sense. They might have been acceptable yesterday, I'm not interested in that. Are they acceptable now? And if they're not, then let's have a, con a conversation about how we change them. And that's, you know, because we feel that if we've got that community of people together and they do care, then they'll want to look after it. And you have to give them access to some sort of blueprint which they can frame in their own way so that they can find a path to, to change. And, and I, you know, that's again why I went a bit ranty. You were going to, you did it again. I went a bit ranty yeah, in, the book. in the book. Yes. <laughs> it's not ranty at all. And in fact, um, I'm, I'm sitting here feeling really pleased because a few of the things I identified in the book that are unusual, exceptional, unique about it are the very fact that you dare to say the things. And it's both of you, it's obviously coming from both of you, but if I, you put in words something I've been thinking all year, right at the start in the introduction. Now these, Megan, happen to be Chris's words, but I know they come from you both. While for the citizens of the UK, the Californian and Australian wildfires, the destruction of the rainforest and the melting poles all seemed far away. Suddenly, a lethal virus, which had possibly jumped from a bat to a, pan up to a pangolin, was potentially in their home or in them. This was the unsustainable abuse of our earth writ large and the full horror of its repercussions still remain unimaginable. And I think we have been very shy as a nation, as, as a planet, as a species to make that connection, which this is all, the mess we're in now is all about our abuse of the natural world, whichever way one approaches it. And there, there was a, an extraordinary moment when um, mink farms in Denmark had a new strain of coronavirus, and it was almost layers upon layer of our abuses of the natural world that were leading to this situation. Um, so so I, 
I thank you both and applaud you for that because the book is unusual in speaking those truths. I've silenced you. No, not at all. I think, I, I think you're right. And I think that someone has to say them. And we live in a, a risk-averse world where I think too many people look over their shoulder and they're too calculating about what they think is the tactically right thing to do and so on and so forth. But for me, there's only one tactical right thing to do, and that's tell the truth, as we know it at that point in time. And, and retain the right to change your mind if the truth changes, more research is done, so on and so forth. And, and that does happen. Science constantly updates itself. You know, we, like your, one of your, the favorite things in my book is that, you know, when I, when we, we, we always thought that butterflies' wings were dried slivers of dead tissue, like our fingernails and hair and everything else. Next turns up the fact that they're not actually, they're, they're living and, and they've got hearts in them and they're used for thermoregulation. So we update our thinking accordingly. We look at butterflies in an entirely new way. I no longer look at them in the same, in, in the same way, quite literally. They, they've enlarged, actually. Their capacity is greater that, you know, when, when I look at those fragile little insects. Um, but we need to do that when we learn things about the environment. And there are all sorts of things that we're constantly faced with where we're given answers, we're given truth by scientists, and we collectively need to make best informed decisions as to how we implement those into our, our lives, into society, and into practice around the world. Otherwise, we're in deep trouble. And, and I, we are both firm believers, aren't we? I mean, you spent the last week talking to scientists all around the world for your next project. Perhaps. But we are both firm believers that we, we should be listening a lot more to those scientists who are at the forefront of uncovering the information that we need to survive sustainably on, on this planet. Uh, but it's also about building up a connection again, because I feel like a lot of the population is incredibly disconnected from the climate crisis. It's something, actually I write about in the book, the psychology of the climate crisis and how it makes us feel, is that it's too big and too far away for us to really, and too slow moving for us to be so immediately thinking about the solutions. We don't want to put those solutions in play because it's like, oh, well, it might happen in a hundred years. And actually the human brain isn't wired to deal with threats for a hundred years time. It's, to, it's wired to deal with threats for today, tomorrow, next week. Um, so it's kind of about making that more immediate and it is now more immediate than whatsoever than ever. Um, and that's why I, I kind of say in the book, you know, perhaps there's a theory why, you know, Fridays for Future movement, there's a lot of youth activism going on. That's because it is within more so their immediate future than it is perhaps Chris's generation, and even maybe mine. Um, so there is this kind of uh, renewed, I don't know, uh, mentality of people kind of connecting the dots, making it kind of realistic and realizing that it is within their lifetime and it is happening to them. And I think the two most dangerous mindsets that humans have that I hear all of the time, and it goes for you know many different things, you know, I'm only one person, what difference can I possibly do? You know, I hear that and it's just, it's frustrating because everybody can make a difference and we need everybody to do something. We need everyone to wake up and do something different tomorrow than they did from today because every small step no matter how small it could be you know it doesn't have to be you know huge everything should be celebrated and it's all steps in the right direction so that's one mindset that you know i think is really troubling and the second is oh well you know someone else will do it it's like well who you know if you if it matters to you if you think about it and you care about it then why not you why not say something you know you could just think something and click share on social media and then you immediately enhance the audience that sees that resource that sees that new information um talk to your friends talk to your neighbors you know it doesn't have to be big groundbreaking stuff but little things are really important everybody can make a difference and no someone else might not do it so you may as well do it too so we have to be open we have to be honest and have sometimes uncomfortable conversations about changing perceptions and mindsets, because if we don't, we're all in a lot of trouble. We really are. And I, I can see because we, there's so much to talk about that actually I may not get to some of my later on questions, otherwise we'll be here all night and I don't want to be keeping you up well. Which one of you, just, just asking, which one of you goes to bed really late and gets up late then? I, I, I probably stay up later. Do you? <laughs> Well, I'm a, I'm a bit of a night owl. I quite like being nocturnal. So, oh um, yeah, I, I'm a fan. There's no way we're going to be friends. I'm a morning person. <laughs> oh, I see. I'm not the best morning person. I've got better, but I'm still, you know, not my happiest, not my sharpest. I like working in the evening, so I can stay up working till 2am or something. Yeah, I'm not a great morning person in the sense that I, I can get up 
at any time, you know, whatever time was you required. You like a bit more of a lion than you admit to. Well, <laughs> do you know what? I did have a lion this morning because it was a fascinating program on Radio 4 about F. Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby. And I got up. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, I'm massively into it to Scott Fitzgerald's writing. So do you know what? I, I'm going to confess something here. Go on. So what, I got up and was dealing with the dogs. It was absolutely tipping down with rain. And typically I would take them out because they want to go. As soon as they're awake, they want to go. And so it's as soon as it's light, basically, I have to get up and take them out. Anyway, at the winter, in the winter, it's a bit later than it should be. Um, but this morning I looked out the window, let them out. They were begging to come back in because it was <laughs> absolutely torrential. And I dried them off and thought, oh, I might just give it a few minutes then before we go out and the three of us get soaked. And then I heard on the Today programme, there was this F. F Scott Fitzgerald thing. So we went back to bed and listened to it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think you deserve a line, especially since you're going to be working very hard very soon. But jumping back to... Jumping back to Chris Pack and the Megan McCubbins, Back to Nature, which you can purchase through the link in the chat. And if you do so, a 10% donation will be made by our friends, Wild Sounds and Books to Conservation, including Norfolk Wildlife Trust. Um, jumping back to that, we do need to start from a baseline understanding of what's going on. Now, Megan, in a sense, you haven't seen the declines that Chris and I have seen in our own lifetimes but we have to start from an understanding that the UK countryside is not okay that we have lost unbelievable amounts of our wildlife of our connectivity of landscape of the ecological function of our landscape and as a result of all that species and it is in it's from a very low baseline from a parlous state that we're beginning to campaign, or that we have been campaigning, but your book comes from the point of view of campaigning on behalf of that. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, we're one of the most nature depleted countries in Europe. It is shocking how much we have lost. I mean, I was up in Scotland in September and I was expecting to be, you know, shocked with the sights of, you know, eagles, red deer everywhere and all this, and it just wasn't there. I mean, I happened to, I got a good tip off about an eagle site. So I did go and see a golden eagle, which was amazing. Um, but I was expecting so much more wildlife and it just simply isn't there. It doesn't, it's not there anymore. Um, and, you know, I, th I feel like it's really sad because it's something called shifting baseline syndrome. For me, you know, those are all the lines that, you know, the, the levels, the abundance that I'm used to. I don't know what it's like, you know, Chris talks about stories of, you know, huge flocks of birds that, I mean, I can only dream of, I've got no idea. So for me, what I see is normal. Um, and that's a quite a dangerous thing when people think that what they see in their lifetimes is normal, because actually if they talk to their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, normal was very, very different. And we should be used to seeing a lot more biodiversity than we are. And it's a dangerous kind of comfort that we're lulled into by thinking, you know, oh, well, you know, it hasn't changed much in the last few years. Well, we need to broaden that horizon and broaden what we're looking at because we have lost a lot and there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and, and it's palpable and, and, it, and, and we know it subjectively in the sense that, you know, so I'm 59 years old and I, I've got massively into birds in sort of 1970. Um, and, I've, you know, by the time it's sort of 72, 73, I could probably identify most of them that I could see around Hampshire. And I had turtle doves nesting in my school grounds. You know, it, it, I went out one evening in about 1977 and I found three yellow wagtails nest in succession on one in one field. Now, neither of these species are now breeding in, in Hampshire. And, and the one thing that's really profound, you know, because of the title of the book, you know, was that prescient book that was published in the early 60s called Silent Spring. Well, it's happened. You know, I, I bought a house in France quite a few years ago. And when I went out there, I looked through the windows open in spring, I was just like deafened. And I'd come back to the UK, I'd drive back home, and I'd throw the windows open the new forest and I'd be struggling to hear anything. And, and my friend, Mark Constantine, um, who's massively into birds and, and bird song, you know, he's right. He says that silent spring has come and gone. You know, we're now listening to a very depleted bird fauna in, 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 in spring. And I remember, you know, that deafening cacophony of passerines belting out their notes, you know, in, in the woodland. And now you go out and you can identify individuals. In, in, in the old days, forgive me, um, you know, there was such an abundance of song, you'd be struggling to find which one was where and who it was. Yep. So, I mean, that's all subjective stuff, but we know it's backed up by, you know, great 
data from people like the BTO with their farmland bound, their woodland bird um, indices, which are accurate because of the extraordinary skill of the um, you know, volunteer naturalists that we have in the UK. Um, and, and that's happened in my lifetime. I, I can't think of anything more tragic, to be quite honest with you, anything to motivate more guilt and discomfort. And yet at the same time, you know, more desire to set that alarm clock even earlier than when it gets light and the poodles start jumping on my head, um, to, to get up and try and make a difference, to set it right. Because it's happened, Nick, on our watch. I mean, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yeah, but if you go back to your, your dad and your granddad, there would have been even more birds. And you're right. But the, the most steep declines have happened in that period since 1970, since we were into wildlife. And that's happened on our watch. And many, many of your viewers this evening um, on their watch too. And, and that's where I feel such a great compunction to, to try and redress that. You know, it makes me I'm, uncomfortable. I'm with you, although it can be hard to, it can be very hard to keep the faith because we have lost so much. And I, having lived for 10 years in South America and then four years in India, I'm back three miles from where I grew up. And three miles in that direction, when I was a small child, there were willow tits. Now we have probably one pair of willow tits left in Norfolk now. And 10 miles in that direction, there were breeding tree pipits. Well, they don't breed along the North Norfolk coast. You can tell the North is there, the coast is just up there. Um, uh, we had tree pipits. We had nightingales breeding. Well, they don't now breed within 25 miles of, of where I am, or 20 miles probably. Um, and these things are, as you say, just winking out little by little. When I first lived in this house, nightingale was still just uh, a five minute walk along an old railway line um, from here. And these things, they're just winking out. And that is, as you say, heart-wrenchingly tragic. Do you think, now this is slightly, I, I, and I'm not here attempting to prompt you to bite the hand that feeds you. This isn't an attack on the BBC. It happens that this came from a BBC website or, or social media, but, but it's not about the BBC. But there was a, a big thing on Twitter this week where it happened to be country file, but it could be any form of communication. Tweeted a picture of a Herdwick sheep in the Lake District extolling the virtues of this landscape. And I worry that we have in the UK a self-fulfilling story that we're the good guys, that we're, we're the ones who, who understand that we have gone out into the world and preserved nature and taught other people to preserve nature, when in fact, the polar opposite is the case. And we live in this dreadfully depleted, I wonder sometimes that, in just the narratives we tell ourselves and in the media and social media, we have this myth that everything's fine, that we keep putting out there. Well, I think you're right. I saw the tweet and um, I more than sighed. <laughs> I think that, um, I think in the context of landscape, we are, um, you know, we are sort of burdened with an idealized concept of the way that that landscape should look. And I think it started, you know, from my perception of history with people like Ruskin and Wordsworth, and they were, you know, wandering lonely as a cloud with his host of golden daffodils there in, in, in the Lake District. And of course, what they didn't realize at that point in time, um, because they didn't have, the, you know, the, we hadn't done the science and they weren't ecologists, um, they were poets and, and philosophers really, um, was that what they were looking at was a highly modified trashed landscape. But when you look at all of those paintings and you look at all of those, you know, ideals of what the green and pleasant land is, I still think that they're deeply sown into our consciousness as a, as a country. So when people travel under normal circumstances through the UK, they look out the windows of their cars, they look out the windows of the train, or they look sideways when they're cycling and they see it green and they see what they perceive are hedgerows um, and, and they think it's okay, but it's not okay because the green is improved pasture. It's a monoculture that's, you know, that's intensively managed and, and, and pretty poor for wildlife. M many of the hedgerows are flailed to within an inch of their lives and they don't support you know, seed in the winter for birds to feed on all those berries. They don't provide song posts or nesting habitat. You know, and this is because People have been sold this vision, a vision they now believe in, but it's one that's fallacious. 
And it's quite hard, isn't it, to take something away from people, to take something which they rely upon, which they feel comfortable in because they think it's okay. Well, and more than, as you say, more than think it's okay, they think it's great. But in fact, they've got it really badly wrong. But I think it goes back a long time. It's not something that we've been responsible for. I think it, it, it's an historical legacy that we're dealing with here. Um, and it's why we struggle with things like rewilding, because we're asking people to change their complete visual mindset as to how the landscape should look and act and exist ecologically. Because they've been told that the landscape needs to look like barren monoculture and flailed hedgerows and our uplands devoid of trees and forests. Yes. It, I, I, it's a tough ask. And what Megan was saying about, was it the first time, Megan, that you've been to Scotland to, to look for golden eagles and, uh, and all of those species? And, and you were shocked by the paucity of wildlife because, again, you've been sold this monarch of the glen image of what our landscape ought to look like even the wildest parts thereof. yeah i mean it was not the first time i've been to scotland um but it is definitely you know i went up there for 10 days and it was kind of gonna i had a camper van and looked around the coast and the whole idea was to kind of go and see kind of see the wildlife that was there and do some exploring and some hiking as a bit of a kind of a staycation and um it, there was just nothing it was totally barren you know and what looked green and what looked beautiful you know, should have been covered in broadleaf woodland. Um, you know, green doesn't always equal good. Um, just because, you know, something, you know, looks how, they, you've got to look a bit closer. You know, what's missing? Look up at the sky, look down at your feet. What invertebrates can you see? What birds can you see flying? What can you hear? Because if you listen and you pay attention to those senses and you look for it, you actually notice there's nothing there. Absolutely so. And we may have time to come to this later on, that there are obviously, there is a tide going against. So you went to Scotland to look for eagles this year. I had one fly over my house. I had oh. a tailed eagle fly over my house. I was sitting in the back garden just there on a really sunny day. And I saw this, I was reading, and I saw the shadow go over my house. And following the shadow, I saw a buzzard. And the buzzard was completely and utterly dwarfed by this magnificent beast. And it disappeared in half a second as it went over the back of the house. And, and I went, oh my goodness me, that was a white tailed eagle. And I've had the immense privilege of seeing white tailed eagles in many, many places in Europe and Asia. And I knew in my soul what it was, but I went, I can't, I can't prove it was. And then the next day, the satellite map was released and the thing flew right over my house, <laughs> which was incredibly thrilling. Incredibly, incredibly. Your house, Nick. I don't know why I was in Scotland. I should have come to you. We should have done. And I had a corn crake that I could hear from. Oh, my head. Yes. that's great. That's I did, that, that really was magic. I live between Penstorp, which is just over there, and Sculthorpe Moor, both of which are places you know well, Chris. Mm. And um, Penstorp has been breathing corn crakes for release into East Anglia for the last decade and I had the enormous privilege of releasing corn crates twice this year and one of um, well we don't know how old the bird was because he was never able to be caught to read his ring but one of the birds that may have been from last year the year before set up about 500 meters from my house and on the stillest days in the spring I could hear him from my bed which was oh. just utterly utterly magical just on words. so there are reasons to keep fighting and if we are to keep fighting we very, very much need to do something. And again, this is something that with tremendous humility, if I may, if I may allow you that, you say that we must work together. Now, to me, it's a no brainer that we're all on the same team. Whichever way we approach landscape, we need it to be healthy. We need landscape to be functional. We need water, we need oxygen, we need soils, we need biodiversity because it is the cornerstone of our existence. And it doesn't matter whether you're a farmer, whether you're someone who shoots, whether you're a nature conservationist, an ecologist, whether you're someone who writes novels featuring the landscape, we all desperately, urgently, in, a, in an absolutely fundamental biological way, we need a relationship with nature. And your book is very, very, very clear and powerful. Again, going back to the introduction here, um, I'm giving you the facts. 
But as ever, we don't expect or even want you to agree with all our opinions. What we want you to do is think about them and formulate your own. All we need to make progress is commonality, not complete agreement. We need to change that most difficult of human challenges. And because some of that change needs to happen very, very quickly, we will meet reluctance and outright resistance. We're not dismayed by this. To us, it's a nuisance, nothing more. We're going to make one last stand for nature because we have no choice. We have to be the voice of the persecuted and oppressed. But the particular thing I wanted to pick up on there, and you touch on it much later in the book as, as well, is this idea of us all working together. And you did mention this earlier, Chris, but we are much, much, much too polarized in our relationship yeah. with nature and one another. Yeah, we are. And it's getting worse. Um, and you would think that given the, you know, the activities in the United States recently on Capitol Hill, that we collectively as a species would be learning that to engender hate and division is a very dangerous thing to do because it threatens the very you know, fundamental principles that we build our societies upon. And we like to think in the UK that we live in a society which, which at least purports to be a democracy. And therefore to, you know, in the wake of those sorts of events, to continue to engender division and hatred is defies belief, to be quite honest with you. And I think there's a ghastly new habit abroad, and that is that if someone voices a, a fact or an opinion or an idea which you don't share, the, the knee-jerk reaction to it now is to call it a lie and, and then keep calling it a lie until other people who share your views believe it's a lie. And it's almost like you're transforming the truth. And that is a very, very dangerous thing for us to tolerate and entertain. Because some of us, you know, like to base our, you know, what should we say, our communications on the truths that we know and the truths that we learn and, and the truths that we seek. But just to have people who have different ideas calling them lies is entirely counterproductive because ultimately you're right, Nick, you know, if we are to solve our problems, we need a, and certainly when it comes to natural history and, and in the UK, we need a functional, and by that I mean ecological, economical, um, and, and in terms of, you know, rural community societies, um, working landscape, but it does need to be a different one. And that means that we will have to change things and things that we have been doing, things that we have been getting away with, cannot any longer persist. Now, sometimes we can entertain change over a, a long period of time through education, and we invest in educating people, and particularly young people, and we hope that that education bears fruit at some stage in the future. But as you equally read in the um, introduction, in some instances, if not more broadly, we are currently making a last stand for nature. This is our last chance to fix it. And on that account, we do sometimes not only have to use the carrot, but also a bit of stick too. And therefore we have to say that laws need to be upheld um, and that you know, uh, practices need to be reviewed and, and regulation needs to be brought in if, if things are being abused, because simply we've run out of time. You know? And sometimes we've been trying to educate people and they've been resistant to it um, because they may have vested interests which oppose that sort of change and an often significant interest. But that's why we find ourselves embroiled in sometimes what unfortunately appears to be conflict, but it's entirely counterproductive. It's, it's entirely opposite of what we want to do. We don't want to be embroiled in conflict. We want to be embroiled in conversation. You know, we want to find means of compromise and, and shared ideas. And, it's so disappointing sometimes to, um, to constantly be pushing back against, um, you know, that division more than, you know, making real progress by working together. It's like the Red Queen, you know, in, in Alice in Wonderland. It's all the running you can do to stay in the same place. But I don't want to stay in the same place. I want to move forward. I don't want to have to spend so much of my energy trying just to stay in the same place. And none of us do because we have the capacity as conservationists to move forward very rapidly. And as the book outlines, and again, it's Megs' bits in the book, you know, we have 
the ability to restore, um, repair, reintroduce, all of these sorts of things, rebuild our biodiversity. And we can do it now, right now, like now or tomorrow morning, you know, and, and we've got all of those techniques, all of those abilities and energies in our arsenal. Um, and we, and, but we do need to get on with it because it's the last stand. Very much is. Now, Megan, I want to actually follow up uh, what Chris just said about the science with another question, but just it's something that just popped into my head right now. In the last uh, four months, I've been cycling around Norfolk. I don't drive whenever, I've given up flying and I don't drive whenever I um, can. And so I cycle to go out to look for wildlife. And I've been cycling particularly after geese and I've cycled 700 miles after geese in the last four months because I completely love geese. And I am surrounded by pink-footed geese, dark-bellied brent geese. Um, there's a flock of greater white-fronted, um, or Russian white-fronted, greater white-fronted geese on the coast just not far from me. And I happened to mention, because I talked to everybody about geese on Twitter, that this year the pink feet have been having a terribly torrid time. So for anyone who isn't from Norfolk, who hasn't got much to do with Norfolk, a huge chunk of the world population of pink-footed geese, they pretty much, not the whole population, there's a population in Svalbard, but the the big population, about 530,000 birds nests in Iceland and then up into Greenland. And a good chunk, some years up to a quarter of them come to Norfolk for the winter. All of them come to the UK. And they feed largely in sugar beet. And the sugar beet is great because it gets harvested and little bits get left in the fields and the pink feet get fat on the sugar and then they go back to in the spring to Iceland and they're doing great. But this year, for all sorts of reasons, the last few years, wheat has been drilled as soon as the beet has been harvested. So the geese early in the year for the first two months were flying around panicked and hungry being driven off the fields. And I happened to tweet about this and a colleague from Natural England picked up on it and he challenged one or two farmers online. He talked to Jake Fines, you may know Jake Fines, the manager of the Holcomb Estate, who, for the conservation manager. And together they all agreed that they would have a summit about allowing the pink-footed geese a breathing space in the landscape. So as you say, we have the power to effect. Now this was accidental from a tweet that I made bemoaning the fact that the pinks were being pushed from pillar to post without being able to feed, which of course is what drives them to desperation. And then they end up getting into trouble by going onto crops where they didn't ought to be. So as you say, that's an example of, of how things can, can, can go right. But Megan, if I can just follow up what Chris was just saying about your bits in the book, particularly. There are so many, as Chris was saying, wow moments. There are so many, oh my Lord, nature is just so incredible. Do you have any that when you read them, you were just thinking, oh, I'm so excited to talk about this. Um, were there any particular highlights from the book that you were, punch the air moments when you found out something totally stupendous? Oh, so many, so many, you know, and I, I do do all the kind of the great science bits and I get to talk about kind of human psychology when it comes to climate, which is fascinating, kind of the talk, uh, you know, talk about movements and talk about community based projects and kind of have case studies, if you want, of examples of where conservation has gone right, where solutions have worked. And that has always been really great to write about because, well, you know, Chris six are kind of slightly more doom and gloom in some cases. And um, I got to kind of write about when it was working, which was really brilliant. Um, but in terms of science, bits I mean there's so many great things that come out every day I mean I you know I see things all the time but in terms of what's in the book uh, my uh, one of my favorites is about zebra finches so we know when birds sleep that when we look at their brain activity their brain patterns neurons are really active when they're asleep in the same way that they're active when they're awake and when they're singing and essentially scientists believe that birds when they're asleep are able to fine tune and basically rehearse their songs in their head so that they, when they wake up, they are better prepared for the breeding season to compete for mates and best singing perches and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they're practicing whilst they sleep, but there's, you know, we knew this for about the last 20 years or so. So this has been something that's kind of scientists have thought about. And they did some more studies looking at zebra finches and zebra finches are you know, a very um, common bird to study. Um, a lot of kind of, uh, you know, if you're looking at small birds of that type, a lot of the studies are done on zebra finches and they looked at not just their brain activity whilst they slept, but they looked at their vocal muscles as well. And they found that if 
the bird was uh, had enough airflow going through its respiratory system then the bird's vocal cords were actually so active and so engaged that the birds could be singing whilst they slept and I thought there was something very beautiful and poetic about that. It is quite quite beautiful and there are many many poetic um, sequences in the book where you know Chris is talking about doom and gloom as you say he's talking about the hard facts of the way we treat the environment but then you will come in with an aside which is full of information that inspires about something related to that very subject and, and of course you end each chapter with a reflection on on a similar subject and um, it works it works very beautifully and is balanced very beautifully in that way I was saying to you just before we came on well Chris was uh, on another call that um, I myself have lost my voice this year and the reason I've lost my voice I'm almost certain is because I'm not a zebra finch and I have not spoken to anyone this year and I honestly think I have lost the muscle tone in my throat because I don't live with anybody and I haven't spoken to anybody for a year so I'm I'm really straining to speak this evening <laughs> Now, I, my fictitious producer in my ear is telling me that we've spoken for almost an hour and nobody has yet made a donation of £100,000 to our appeal to purchase land around Thompson Common to restore ghost pingos, as explained to you by the Packham himself. So if there are any multimillionaires out there who happen to have the odd £100,000 sloshing around and would love to restore some Rex grassland to low nutrient biodiverse grassland and restore some pingos to their former periglacial glory, then there is a link in the chat to be able to do that. And all donations of one pound to one million pounds are more than gratefully received. Thank you very much. Now, are you all right? We've already nearly spoken for an hour. Are you all right if I ask you a couple more? Of course. Okay, Frank. That's very, very kind of you. Thank you very much. And thank you for all to all of our 350 participants who are still with us and still listening. Something that was, these are, these are questions really about this year and the nature of this year. Because there was a, in springtime, now I had the most extraordinary privilege of a, the first lockdown was a time of, actu of great joy for me because I live in a wild place. And I walked hours every day while it was allowed and listened to all my birds coming back. I have 10 species of warbler that breed in a short walking distance from my house. And I have the privilege of having lived for 10 years in Amazonia. These birds are not special to me just because I knew them as a child. They're special to me because I came home to them. And I remember the first willow warbler I heard when I came home from living in South America and I sobbed at the sound of this willow warbler because it means viscerally so much to me. And I welcomed back all of my birds and I had ring oozles migrating through my patch and so on. So my lockdown, first lockdown was a, a spiritual experience. It was a magical experience. And I was hopeful the world would change. I was hopeful that that would be enough for us to see the errors of our way in a sense. And there was a Pandora's box moment where lockdown restrictions were, limit, were lifted and immediately we started going back to the same behaviours. And I'm thinking particularly about the North Norfolk coast where all the wardens are friends of mine, wardens who witnessed ringed blubber chicks being picked off the beach by dogs off leads and wardens who witnessed low nutrient dune systems being trashed by picnics or burnt by barbecues or whatever. And we have this, now we do it at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we do it in the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB does it, Spring Watch, Winter Watch, Autumn Watch, they're, they're all about this idea of reconnecting with nature. But there is also a Pandora's box element about it, that the more we connect, the more footfall there is on the ground and the more direct impact we have. And I wonder if you have any, any thoughts on that, because it is something that that has really troubled me this year, especially through the angst of many friends along the coast who have seen their reserves trashed through the release period from lockdown. Sorry, Megan, you were gonna start there. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I think it's it's how we connect with nature. And I think, you know, we, you know, we do talk about reconnecting with wildlife, but it's also about building up a respect 
for wildlife. You know, a lot of people will go to the beaches, take their, you know, one use single use barbecues out, they'll scorch the vegetation, they'll leave the litter everywhere because it's a pretty sight. It's nice to go to the beach on a hot day, the sea's there, you can go for a dip and it's all very nice, but there isn't that respect and that true connection for nature still there. So I, I you know, I'd say that those people, you know, well, I guess they want to go to an outdoor space and there is, because of that, there is the ability to kind of reconnect them and get that respect back for the wildlife and the the ecosystem that's around them. But it, we haven't currently kind of hit the nail on the head for that reason yet. And, you know, when it comes to dogs off the lead, I mean, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. You know, it's great to go out and be around these sites. It's great for our mental health. It's brilliant, but we have to do so in a respectful way, whether that's, you know, putting the dogs on the lead um, when you're out and about in sensitive areas. And picking up your rubbish and taking it home it's about kind of building up that respect as much as it is about kind of getting people to go to those outdoor places and i think there's one thing to encourage them there but there's another thing to kind of say okay hold back you're going there but what do we do yeah. when you're there i agree with you but i i see i have a fundamental I, I have two dogs and and well, we have two dogs and and they've always been part of our lives and um and we love them greatly and, and we love seeing them run you know it brings nothing but joy to me just to see dogs running for the sheer joy of running and they're great companions they're an essential component of, of my life of our lives um but we're fortunate in the sense that we I mean, in certain times of the year in certain places we put them on the lead because we're aware of ground nesting birds we live in the new forest and and, and not 400 meters from where we're sat curlews breed and curlews is a species of conservation concern and yet very sadly you know, I try to avoid that area in the spring because everyone in their spaniel is out there and they're constantly up off the ground, wheeling around in circles, crying. You know, we've got an overabundance of corvids who could be in there stealing their young or their eggs. And of course, people, when you oh, I used to confront them, would say, my dog's never killed a bird. And you say, nope, it's not about that. It's actually about them just disturbing them repeatedly. And you try and explain things. But it's, it's a hard sell. And on that account, this brings me back to the carrot and stick thing, you know, because in a situation where you have a bird that's plummeting so quickly as curlews, particularly here where we are, numbers have declined very significantly, breeding, breeding numbers have declined very significantly. I wonder now whether, you know, there's time for that education, because very often when you try to impart it, you're met with resistance. Um, and therefore we go back to the mandatory. You know, and I think that there should be in certain situations, you know, say here within the National Park, New Forest National Park, you know, there should be areas that are closed during the breeding season and where there are no dogs um, and they're not even dogs on leads. Um, however, I equally think that if you're going to take something away from people, um, you have to offer them something in return. And there should be areas of our National Park which are enhanced for dog walking. So the paths are well maintained, so they're not constantly muddy. Perhaps we collect grey water and people can use it to wash their dogs before they put them back in their car. Perhaps there are covered areas where they, when it's absolutely tipping down, like it was this morning, they can stand and talk to one another about their dogs, because that's what we dog owners do. We talk about our dogs to one another. Um, and then, you know, and we could make those areas dog walking friendly and enhance the whole experience for those people who want to share time with their companions. And they could be off the lead because they could be in areas where there are no sensitive birds. So I think a balance of definite stick because we cannot lose any more curlews here in the New Forest. And also at the same time, giving people an opportunity to improve the quality of their um, time in the outdoors um, rather than you know, parking in deep muddy rucks and dogs covered in mud in the back of their car and, 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 it, and it being, and, and then basically parking on roadsides where you've got to consider dog safety when they're off the leads because there's traffic here and so on and so forth. We could, we could overcome all of that. So I think it's careful management and just creative thinking again that we need to overcome these things. But frankly, you can only see so many curlews and lapwing and red shank wheeling around in the sky because of the tenth spaniel of that morning. I'm picking on spaniels here, it could be a poodle because we have poodles. The tenth spaniel or poodle of that Labrador, morning, and you know, and you begin to think, listen, this is beyond you know asking people because all the signs are up. Rest assured, Nick, Forestry England are doing their job here in terms of trying to uh, ask people to behave responsibly, but. It's too big an ask. And it's like Meg said with the barbecues, you know, do we just say that you can't use these type of barbecues in certain places? You just say um, you, you, they can't be used here because this is an environmentally sensitive area where fire is a significant risk. 
and therefore you I'm afraid you can't use those which is types, the case for the new forest it, which is the case here I mean it's yeah. a tinderbox in summer and we have a terrible problem with these barbecues here um, yeah. being left and, 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 and litter and, and so forth so it, it's tough um, and you're right to draw attention to the fact that all of the wildlife NGOs and they watch water watch winter watch we're constantly asking people to engage with nature so we get people to develop a greater affinity for it so that when we call upon them for the hundred thousand pounds to protect the area that you need to 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 reinstate your pingos they will understand firstly why you want to do it and if they have the capacity they will help you to do it mm. it's a, such a delicate but, thing within, to but, but my problem is within that messaging we want to also not just build connectivity but we also want to build respect for the natural world as well so there's kind of two elements there i think that yeah that's it but it's hard it is hard it's really hard it's and have we got time for it that's why i say you know dogs on leads you know I mean, here, here's a question here's a question for you um and it's it's always contentious but bear in mind i'm someone that loves nature reserves and loves going to nature reserves loves seeing the hard work that the wardens and volunteers put in to nurture them and maintain them right but i don't take my dogs to a nature reserve even if they're allowed there and in and some reserves, I was at one the other day where dogs were allowed, you know, if they're under control. Well, on that nature reserve, they've had nothing but trouble with dogs killing swans and, and farm stock for, for a long time. I mean, how long does it have to go on before you just say actually no dogs at all? Yeah, I mean, it's logical to me. It seems very logical to me as a dog lover and owner. I don't expect to take my dogs to an area where they could harm wildlife. I, it's... it's it's, it's, it's beyond comprehension. So sometimes they have to stay at home or we have to do different things because I, I will I obviously need to, love to visit nature reserves. We both do, but we don't take our dogs with us, even if they're allowed, because I just think it sets the wrong standard. It sets the, it sets the wrong picture. There's so little space that's protected solely for the benefit of nature now that I don't think we can afford to compromise that. You know, even if we've been doing, even if those that reserves have been allowing dogs there for the last 25 years, the last, in the last 25 years, we go back to our shifting baseline syndrome and all of the BTO work and, you know, farmland bird, woodland bird in, indices, so on and so forth. We've seen catastrophic declines. We're not living 25 years ago. We're living now. Conditions have changed. Therefore, attitudes, rules and, and behavior has to change. And that sometimes means I'm afraid that you cannot take your poodles to that nature reserve. <laughs> Simple, Sid and Nancy, sit in the car or stay at home. I'm sure Sid and Nancy don't approve, but that is a, it's a powerful and important message. Now, it brings me actually directly onto something else. I'm going to read you something of these have to be Chris's words, but lost, lost, like this habitat and these species have mysteriously disappeared into the ether as if they've annoyingly accidentally vanished. They haven't. They've been ploughed up. They are dead or they don't exist. Destroyed is the word we should be using. And much and many of them have been destroyed in our lifetimes on our watch. And that springing from the springing poodle like from the last bit that we were talking about. I think there is a there is a need for a, a truth and reconciliation because we have slumped so low in terms of biodiversity in the landscape, but also in terms of what we all assume is okay. We, we are so incredibly privileged in the developed world. And we live in a world where we all hop on a plane, we all overconsume left, right and center, all manner of things. And we spit our toys out. If we spit out the dummy, throw our toys out the pram. Um, if we have one thing challenged that we do, because we all, have, so going back to Megan's psychology, which is touched on in the book, we all have this fundamental belief, I'm a nice person. Therefore, if you challenge any behavior of mine, you must be wrong. Very few of us are willing to challenge. And that is really the, the crux of your book, really, that we all need to challenge our behaviors. You mentioned nature conservation, um, volunteers, eating, sandwiches or, or a snack that contains palm oil and you're doing good on a British nature reserve. Meanwhile, you are actively slaying an orangutan in Sumatra or Borneo by the fact that you're eating that. We, we have reached a point where we all need to question everything we do. And it is exhausting. 
Yeah, it is exhausting and it's tiring. And, you know, the issues with palm oil and everything, I mean, it's in everything. You literally, you know, you can't get away from it. It's, it is exhausting checking those labels all the time to see whether it's there or not. It's tiring, you know, and it's, it's you're not going to be perfect, right? No one is going to be, you know, perfectly good all of the time, no matter how hard you strive to be. You know, being a human alive on this planet, unfortunately, comes with costs. And those are the environmental costs that you pay for existing essentially and i think there is you know something that we can all do you know if you are a, a volunteer eating palm oil biscuits or if you i don't know are a scientist and you're driving in your car whatever the situation is you know we need to look at the bigger picture because we can't be expected to read every label of everything all the time we get burnt out we get tired very quickly you know we need to put government we need to put policy makers and we need to put the big corporations and businesses at the forefront of that to label appropriately and label clearly so that we know what we're consuming you know that's a really big issue often we you know palm oil is hidden by a plethora of 100 different names you know it's really impossible sometimes to avoid it so we need to know what we're consuming know the impact that it has so that we actually have the options personally to make the ethical choice and that is currently what we don't have is we, you know, the ethical choice is often hidden from us because it's not clearly labelled. And I think that's something that we need to lobby government for. We need to kind of we need to lo lobby government for a lot of different things, you know, a lot of kind of protection policies and um, everything else. But, you know, that's one thing that we can all do rather than just taking it on as an individual level in terms of what we're purchasing and what we're consuming. Obviously, be mindful of that and be careful, you know, what you consume, what you buy. Do you really need it? Think twice about it. But also go to the top. You know, we need to be putting pressure in you know, an more than ever on the bigger people that are responsible for producing it. Um, and we can do that by, you know, your tweet, for example, had a fantastic response for the for the geese. Um, and just kind of putting pressure on IMPs, talk to them, send letters, get use your voice because it does help and work. But um, yeah, we, we need to kind of also look up as well as kind of look at ourselves. And we really do need to look at ourselves. And we need to look hard up. We need to be, mm. we need to be ruthless with this at the moment. I mean, is a classic case in part is that I read recently that the number of new cars had fallen to uh, a post-war low in the UK uh, sold last year, with the exception of electric vehicles. Now, many people, I think, would like an electric vehicle. The handicaps have cost, for one, they're, they're expensive. But another thing is that there aren't sufficient charging points um, for them. So there aren't charging points in supermarkets where people visit re uh, you know, very repeatedly. They're not in schools, they're not at hospitals, they're not at all the places that people would buy stations so that they can recharge whilst they're taking the train. Um, and so here we have an opportunity not to solve all the world's problems. Electric cars, you know, you know, what we think is that during the course of its lifetime, an electric car, given the cost of its production, its transportation, and of course the electricity that it uses, will reduce emissions by 50%. So they're not a magic bullet, but they're like Meg says, they're a step in the right direction. And if you can afford them, and when the price comes down, which it will, because there's a lot more of them being sold now and a lot more competition in the market, um, then, but you still have to be able to, they have to be functional for you. And for many people, particularly in rural co communities at the moment, yes, they can have a home charger installed, but there's, there's, none, there's no others around. So why isn't our government investing in an infrastructure that allows us to make that 50% of the magic bullet when it comes to personal transportation, you know, by investing in, 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 in you know, putting that infrastructure into place, in yeah. providing subsidies for that, providing opportunities for people to do that, work opportunities. So we could employ thousands of people putting the, to, to train people and then put that infrastructure into place. That's job creation, it's green job creation. And I think that one thing that our decisions makers can't see at the moment as they're struggling to, uh, you know, maintain an economy which is under terrible pressure and, and failing are the enormous number of opportunities in, in, in you know, in the, the green sector, if you like. And with relatively small investment, we're talking millions rather than billions of pounds, we could generate lots of jobs and we could generate a far more sustainable existence and landscape. And, you know, behind uh, wildlife 
Link, Wildlife Countryside Link, um, in the spring, a, a collection of NGOs put together a raft of ideas that were presented to government saying, if you gave us this much money, this is what we could do. We, we could restore hundreds of thousands of hectares of UK landscape for the benefit of people and biodiversity. We could generate, you know, 10,000 jobs. We could generate this much moving into rural economies. And all of this science, which is effectively what it is, it's the science of um, socioeconomics, um, it has been done. It's there. It's written in black and white. But our decision makers are trying to get back to normal, that abject abnormal that we had pre-corona. And it was obviously abnormal because we found ourselves in a terrible, terrible predicament. So, uh, you know, one of the other messages in the book very clearly is that we don't want to go back to normal. You know, my mum always used to say, see good in the bad. Corona COVID has been terribly, is terribly, terribly bad, but it does provide us with opportunities to rethink education, transport, our business plans for the future. Do we really need to be moving around the country when we can engage with one another using video conferencing? And certainly we can do that in, in, in a workplace in, in a, a much larger you know, percentage of the time. So we should be using this you know, opportunity. We've been taught a harsh and horrid lesson by nature. If we weren't stupid, we would learn from that and we would invest in a different type of future for people where we would retrain them, re-employ them, generate new economies. And, and, and this isn't fanciful, hiffy thinking. This is all written down by the qualified staff of the UK's non-government conservation organisations. It's there on the table. But our decision makers are ignoring it. And that's why we must, as our book says, raise our voices and ask peacefully and democratically for that to be realised. And that was a rant. It was a rant, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I got that in the You've end. gone off on a few. I've gone now, I've got that. That was a proper well. one, though. That was a proper rant. Well, I'm going to rant back at you, but in your own words, because this is um, from the very end of the book and it's extremely powerful. Um, let me just check. I'm going to. Yes, there we go. Um, so all you farmers, foresters, reserve wardens, teachers, students and children, all of you ologists, scientists, artists, writers and bloggers, you activists, volunteers, gardeners, all of you who have taken a bit of solace and respite from the horrors of 2020 by finding, engaging with and loving nature, can you please see that this is not your last chance to make a difference? It is our species' last chance to make the thing we human, no, I'm so sorry. I thought I was going, I've lost the rest of the, oh, how foolish am I? I've been turning pages over and, oh, here we are. It is our species last chance to make that difference. We don't all have to agree about the details, but we must agree on our shared agenda. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with all who care enough to take some action and be part of making a difference. You, please, you need to make that difference. Our wildlife needs us and it needs you more than ever. Now that is a extremely moving and powerful ending to the book and Megan I want to end, thank you very much both of you for, for listening to so many questions and for sharing so many thoughts but Megan I want to end with some thoughts from a nine-year-old friend of mine because you're the, the you're this you're always uplifting you always have something positive to say and my nine-year-old friend Ella who is actually kind of my goddaughter. When I first met Ella in the car on the way home, she said to her dad, I want him to be my godfather. So de facto, I became Ella. And Ella is the world. She's actually a great, great friend of Patrick Barkham's children and is, a, is an extremely wild child. And Ella wanted me specifically to ask you some questions. And she wanted your top tips for helping people, for specifically helping wildlife and helping animals in their environment, but also helping persuade other people, as a nine-year-old, persuade other people of the importance of doing so. Because Ella is someone who lives, breathes, and exists for nature and for the beauty of nature and for its future. I would say, Ella, go and show your friends how beautiful it is. You know, go and show them something that you love. Go, if you find a butterfly, if you, whatever you find out in your garden, take them and show them it. 
you know, let it, whatever it is, maybe it can crawl on your fingertip or it can crawl through their fingertips. And that might be the first time that they're engaging with that animal. So you've had the most amazing kind of upbringing and have had that connection with nature all along, but maybe your friends haven't. So get them to connect in that way, you know, whether that is a butterfly, a worm, dig through the undergrowth, have a look what's there and kind of spark that spark that you have so brightly. So I, that's one thing I'd say to do, get your friends connected, get talking to them. That's a brilliant thing you can do and just showcase what you love because your passion will be infectious. And if you talk passionately about it, then hopefully the rest of them, your friends will too. And it will kind of spark a whole domino effect. And, um, you know, before you know it, all, all your friends and family will be equally as enthralled as you are. On Ella's behalf, thank you very much indeed, Megan. Now, before we go... <laughs> Oh. I add something though, just a, another top tip for Ella. <laughs> Go on. Well, what's the most important tool that a young naturalist needs? Now, you might think it would be a brand new pair of very special binoculars. You might nice. think that it would be the latest field guide. And there are oh, some good very good field guides being published and sold on the Wild Sounds website as we speak. Um, you might think it would be a magnifying glass or a little bottle to put um, invertebrates yeah, in. Um, it, it could be, it could be Wellington boots because that will guarantee you can go out in any weather, which be, would, would be good. Um, but it's none of these things. The most important tool that a young naturalist needs is an alarm clock because you've got to get up and get out there. And if you're standing up when everyone else is lying down, you're making progress when they're not. And if you're out and about in that world earlier in the day, you will see more and you'll feel more and you'll smell more. And all of those things will enhance your experience. So forget about the 1,200 pounds binoculars that you're fantasizing about because you've seen an advert in this month's Birdwatch magazine and go onto a, an internet shopping site and get yourself an alarm clock for £2.99 and set it 15 minutes earlier every day and use those 15 minutes wisely to connect with nature and then think of a way that you can, as Megan says, share your passion to look after nature. One day, perhaps, Chris and Megan, you will meet my dear friend Ella and you will be inspired by her. I need, in response to what Chris has just said, need to tell you an anecdote about her. Uh, two springs ago, quite early in the spring, it was cold, let's say March, early April, um, I was standing in the field below their house where her dad has, over years, persuaded the farmer to let him build this magnificent pond. I'm talking a pond with a, a, a footprint three times the size of my house, this glorious pond, which is buzzing with dragonflies and um, we were chatting talking about four spotted chasers and and um, all sorts of other dragonflies and so on and so forth and we turned around and Ella had walked into the pond aged eight at the time and was chest deep in the freezing pond and um, there is no need for wellies for that child <laughs> that, that child is is amphibious um, and then the next thing you turn around and she's up a tree anyway brilliant this book, Back to Nature, How to Love Life and Save It, and indeed, as Chris rightly says, hundreds of other titles on nature and our relationship with it are available from our great, great friends at Wild Sounds and Books, and there is a link in your um, chat. There'll also be a link in the email that you've received inviting you to this event, and there'll be links in emails you receive thanking you. There'll be a link also to make a donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, should you wish, and a link to the film on how wonderful our Thompson Common Nature Reserve is and how important it is that we acquire the land around it in order to revert it to low nutrient, sandy brex grassland, and also restore the lost pingos on that farmland. We would like to say a very big thank you to all of you for having been with us this evening, and especially a thank you to Megan McCubbin and to Chris Packham for sharing their passion, for sharing so much information, knowledge, but especially your love of nature and all that has gone into this remarkable book. Chris and Megan, thank you very, very much indeed. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation to yeah. um, to address the Norfolk Wildlife Trust in this time of its, you know, celebrating its great legacy of all those people that have gone out there and stuck their noses into the lives of flies and <laughs> beetles and reptiles and birds and garnered mm. all of that knowledge which they've so kindly and generously passed on to the rest of us. There's nothing quite so great as there's the 
when you're able, bumping into a, an older, and there's always someone older than you, older naturalist, and they tell you some little gem about something that they've seen. And, and again, you know, it sparks your interest. And there'll be many of those in, in the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And yeah, and come on, look after those pingos. Pingos are great. <laughs> I went to a site um, in Norfolk once where the pingos are, and we were talking about obviously how the pingos form, but also about the biodiversity that lives in them. They can be so incredibly rich and wheating, heath, spike, speed whale, sand, catch fly. Wow, we're talking good stuff there, you know. So again, all of those places need looking after and maintaining, and that comes down to a, a lot of hard work. And I think that if there's one thing that we ought to, you know, just sign off by celebrating, um, and you do it in the book, I think, is, is that um, all the volunteers, because without volunteers in British nature conservation, we would not be, have achieved and be achieving all of the things that we do. Um, so the Wildlife Trust staff do a brilliant job, yeah, really but brilliant. there could never be enough of them. You know, that's the bottom line. We could never come up with enough money to pay them all, pay them properly. Um, so we are reliant on those volunteers and everything that they do. And it's a fantastic, yeah. fantastic body of people that do so much good. Yeah. So we'd like to thank them very much indeed. That's very, very kind. And our volunteers in the Wildlife Trust, who are hundreds, who count number in the hundreds, we are immensely grateful. Should anybody be new to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, because obviously Chris and Megan will have brought new people in, they, uh, you can find out about the work of Norfolk Wildlife Trust at our website, which is norfolkwildlifetrust.org.uk. And as I said, if you're interested in joining others of our events in the future, go to clycalling.org which is the, the website we have for these events. And the next person I'm interviewing is Melissa Harrison, who has written a book of her. During lockdown, she's been doing an extraordinary podcast called The Stubborn Light of Things, and she has converted it into a book. And she's next up, and I'll be talking to her in a month's time. Chris, Megan, thank you very much. To all of you who've been listening this evening, thank you very much. Stay safe in these troubled times, and we look forward to catching up with you again very soon. Thank you, and good night. Good night, thanks. Good night. <laughs>